Hello, everyone. Hi, Hello. Good morning. I hope you can. Everyone can see this, and we're um, we're ready to go with this um, chat with Deirdre and John here. Uh, my name's Emma. I'm a nutritional advisor for Burns Pet Nutrition. Have been so for about two years now. I'm here today with John Burns and Deirdre McArdle as part of the Burns and the USPCA Virtual Vet Four Fest this week. Uh, John Burns is a veterinary surgeon and founder of Burns Pet Nutrition supplying natural and healthy diets for pets. And Deirdre has worked for the USPCA for nearly three and a half years, heading up the animal care and rehoming department. John and Deirdre are on hand today to answer all your head to tail pet questions. Uh, so if you do have any questions for us, please just pop them in the chat box. Uh, so Deirdre, how did you become involved with animal care and rehoming? I started with them about three and a half years ago. USPCA animals have always been a big part of my life. Um, since starting, I've actually rescued two dogs from the USPCA. Yeah. And um, also, my kids have also got involved. And it started off with treat collections, and now they actually would help out with the animal care in the centre as well. So it's a bit of a family enterprise at this point. And um, I also bring work home with me in terms of uh, I bring home a lot of faster animals, uh, a lot of kittens and wildlife, like baby birds and things like that. Uh, the odd dog as well so um, it's very much a big part of my life something that I love to do so um, yes that would be a bit basically it I have a big passion for sort of matching the right dog or cat to the right owner yeah and um, it's something I do uh, put a lot of thought into and there's certain dogs obviously and cats that sort of have stolen my heart over the few years and um, one in particular there was dog called Zena. She was a Rottweiler. She's a fabulous dog. She came into us very overweight and she had also hip dysplasia. Uh, so she had a few medical needs as well. So she was with us for quite a long time because it took us a while getting the right owner for her. So the two of us had a very special bond. I would have taken her myself only it wouldn't have worked with my own dogs. Yeah. But um, eventually got eventually got a good home for her and she's very happy now. So it's things like that that keep me going to work every day. Yeah. Never a dull moment in your house then, and it's no. been, um, very, very rewarding for you as well, and your family to see that as well. Yes, very much so. In fact, I have a wee foster kitten at the minute, and one of my dogs in particular just wants to be a big, big mommy for her. So it's working out well. Oh, lovely, lovely. And John, um, tell us how you came to start up Burns Pet Nutrition. Well, it's, it's a quite complicated, long-running story, really. Some people think that I just decided one day to, in fact, the story sometimes circulates that I just decided one day to start up my own dog food, but it wasn't like that at all. I graduated from Glasgow 50 years ago this year, and the first job I took, in fact, the only proper job I've had, uh, was a large animal practitioner in West Wales. And uh, we did see the odd dog or cat, you know, with, say, with skin or ear problems. And I would tell you, on our well, we don't really know what's causing this and we can relieve it, you know, we used, used antibiotics and steroids, say, for it, you know, to treat the problem and the problem would clear up and then either after a wee while when the drug stopped or soon after the problem would come back again and I thought, well, that's not really how I saw my professional life. Anyway, I read an article about acupuncture and I thought that offers an additional form of therapy. I went off to study that as a human acupuncture. And while doing that, I got into traditional Oriental medicine via a Japanese American um, movement called microbiotics. And mm -hmm. again, we're talking about human health here, and human human uh, philosophy, really. Uh, anyway, an important part of this teaching was that uh, the traditional way of eating for humans was based on whole grains and vegetables and that meat would only be form a small part of that. Uh, uh, since in recent times, especially since the war, we in the West have abandoned that way of eating and uh, we've turned it on its head, in fact, so that our diet now is primarily based on animal products, meat and dairy foods and vegetables and whole grains form a much smaller part of that. And we also look at chemical foods and refined foods and the consequence of that is that uh, we've um, come subject to lots of degenerative diseases 
uh, mental health and uh, wasting diseases and cancer and so on. So I was kind of hooked in this. It was life changing for me to, to learn about this. And uh, I decided to apply it in my own veterinary practice. When I came across a health problem, I treated it with drugs. Um, but I'd advise the owner not to feed any commercial pet food, but to feed homemade brown rice, vegetables, and meat, maybe a third of each. And when, when the owner did that, the health problem would go away and wouldn't come back again, and that was a critical thing. Uh, I used drugs, of course, for short-term benefits. But, yeah. um, the difficulty with this home cooking thing was that the uh, majority of people didn't really want to be doing it. You know, and, uh, um, if people had followed my advice, there would be no burns pet nutrition, but pet owners would be at home cooking brown rice and vegetables and meat for the pets. You know. So I got into the commercial side of things because I realised that um, people were going to feed their pets in the way I believed the food would have to be available in a convenient form. So that's what I, I spent years looking into that and finally got going in 1993. So, and the rest, they say, is history. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, quite often um, people turn to drugs and, and they, they just mask the symptoms, don't they? They're not really dealing with, with the root cause. And, you know, you need to look at the body and the system um, as a whole and, and the body will naturally sort of want to tend towards good health. So, you know, nutrition is such an important part of that, isn't it? Yeah, well, for me, uh, I know I'm, I may be a bit off the scale here, but uh, for me, nutrition underpins everything, really, even if it's... Even if uh, nutrition isn't the, the sole uh, factor in causing health problems, um, it's important as a, as a bedrock of any management. Yeah, and and Deirdre, you know, in, in rescue, you must see see that yourself with some of the animals coming in, um, some suffering from the effects of undernutrition, and perhaps coming in malnourished and and, and underweight. But of course, the pets coming in as well, suffering from overnutrition, then, if you like, and coming in. You mentioned the Rottweiler that, um, you know, w was overweight uh, with joint disease. Um, so, yeah, you you must see that from sort of both sides then, both sides of the... Oh, very, very much so. Um, in fact, the, the Rottweiler was put on Burns Weight Control and the weight yeah. came off great. Helped her health in general, especially with her dysplasia. Um, it definitely it sort of settled down symptoms of that too. And again, you're right, there will be dogs that come in very underweight and not even on the right type of diet at all. And it, it's, it's taking patience. Patience is a big thing in animal health. It's taking the time to know that you, if you persevere, you will get the results and not, not expecting things to change overnight. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both. Um, so we've got some, um, I've got some questions for you both this morning then, and then we'll take a little bit of time um, at the end to answer any, any questions that come through. So please, if you're watching and you've, you've got a burning question or anything that you want to ask Deirdre and John, just pop it in the in the box and we will find some time at the end to, to go through those questions. Um, so the first part then really is, is a little bit on rehoming and rescue. So for you, Deirdre, um, so how does the USPCA rehoming process work? To sort of talk us through through what we would expect. Yeah, so um, any animals we would have for rehoming, we would have up on our website. And if there's a, any animal in particular that sort of catches your eye or you want more information about, you certainly get in touch with us through the website or you can ring us. What would happen is the first person to contact us would uh, be given uh, an appointment to come down and view the animal, to see the animal, meet the animal. You just talk things over with our animal care officer and um, you can get out, find out more information about the animal. And also we would find out more information about you to make yeah. sure that uh, it's going to be a right match. If that goes well, certainly encourage a second view, especially for dogs. Um, and sometimes you may have a dog already at home, so you'd be encouraged to bring that dog along so they can meet. Yeah. Um, definitely wouldn't want to rehome a, a dog to a house that has a dog and they've never met before, it's just fair. Um, if that all goes well, then we'd certainly do home checks for the dogs, where we I would assess the house and do a questionnaire with you. We'd go through advice on what to expect bringing a new animal home, yeah. um, different things that um, in terms of vet side of things, different treatments for fleas and worms, your boosters, things like that. Everything will be gone through with you beforehand. 
if for some reason that person decided not to go ahead with that animal, we have a waiting list of say, the second, third, fourth, fifth person who has contacted us about that particular animal, we'd contact them the next person on the list. Yeah, so even even if somebody um, isn't that you know they know they want to re to rescue eventually, um, but but not sort of quite the right time, is it always worth them sort of getting in touch and, and oh, finding yes. out the process and um, you know asking all of those questions and making that contact with you anyway? Exactly. Yes, we're more than happy to talk to anybody. In fact, we would encourage that sort of contact because yeah. it means you're putting thought into things, and it's not something that's done on the spur of the moment. Definitely. No problem. We would contact. We would speak to people on a regular basis about that. You need to be thinking about like types of breed, what sort of lifestyle you have. Yeah. Questions like that sort of trigger in their minds as to what exactly will suit them. Brilliant. And is there anything that people should take into consideration about rehoming a rescue animal? Yes, as I mentioned, you know the likes of your lifestyle. If you're away at work ten hours a day, maybe a dog's not necessarily for you because they're going to be on their own for so long. You also need to think about the expense in having a dog. You yes, you have your regular veterinary bills every year. You've got your fleas, your worms, your vaccinations. There, something might come up that you weren't expecting. So there's like the insurance. Then there's things like going on a holiday. You might need to use kennels. That's another expense. So things like that you need to think of. You certainly need to think of the type of dog you're going to take on. What type of breed it is. Do you know anything about that breed? Some have are more prone to medical conditions. Yeah. or um, different temperaments. You Also the size of the dog. If you've yeah. got a very small garden, a large breed dog is not going to necessarily suit. Um, so all that sort of needs to be taken into consideration before you even take on a dog. Then if you, when you do take on a dog, you need to be able to spend time with that dog, to build, to build a bond, do yeah. training. Puppies yeah. in particular, people are very keen on puppies and kittens. Puppies in particular are very time consuming. Yeah. And it's like having a baby in the house. So you need to be able to spend the time to do the training properly so yeah. that it, and the socialization properly so that it grows up to be a balanced dog. Yeah. So all that has to be taken into consideration before um, doing anything like that. So how, um, you know, how would you introduce a new pet to the family and help them settle into, into their new environment then? Yeah, the first word I'd use is patience mm -hmm. and um, doing it slowly. Yeah. You don't want to, um, whenever you bring an animal into the house, you don't want to be uh, smothering it. You want the animal to be able to come to you as opposed to you trying to force yourself on the animal. They need to try to press, don't they, and, and, and get their bearings. Exactly. Yeah, it's a good idea just to confine them to one or two rooms at first so that yeah. it's not overwhelming for them. Let them settle into those one or two rooms before yeah. I introduce them to the rest of the house. Just do it. Everything has to be done by degrees. And um, if you want to use treats sometimes, maybe to encourage them to start building that bond, certainly use treats, but make sure they're healthy treats and not many of them. And yeah. also you'd have to consider if you are using treats to take it out of the, the their diet for the rest of the day and so that they're not being overfed. Are there any products um, that you know you can use to help them settle into their new home? There would be, there would be the likes of, um, if it is an anxious type of animal, uh, you can use, there's lots of different uh, calming sprays on the market or plug-in sprays. You can also use stimulating toys as well. Some toys you can put treats into so that um, it sort of stimulates them, it tires them out and makes them more relaxed as well. You also want to praise good behavior with dogs or, ca or cats. Um, if they're doing something right, certainly let them know that. Um, you need to um, let them have their own space. Don't don't sort of force yourself on them all the time. I'd also ask people to introduce new people slowly to the house um, so it's not overwhelming for them. Let them settle in, calm down, and then certainly extended family can certainly be introduced. But again, do it slowly and let dog or cat come to them. Don't force yourself on them. It's, it's just not fair. And it's hard, isn't it? Because people will be excited to bring their new pet exactly. home and they want to introduce them to all their friends and their family. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So how would you introduce uh, a new pet to existing pets then? Is it is the sort of same same principles? Patience is key? Patience is key. Um, for If it's two dogs, I would definitely uh, say that they should be introduced away from the house in a sort of a secure open area, preferably. Um, away 
from their, their normal smells and everything else. And you do that slowly, ideally keep them on the lead at first because you want to be able to keep control of the whole situation. Yeah. You know, you could go for a walk, they're walking side by side, but not too close together. And then as things progress, bring them closer together to the point where they can smell and each other. If that's going well, then yes, take them off the lead for a very short time so they can again smell each other, want to play. You're looking for good positive signs from the dogs like the two paws going down, sort of, I want to play, or um, things you don't want to see is the tail tucked between the legs or hair on the back of the neck going up. Yeah. So it's keeping a very close eye on all that and keep it short. It's not gonna, you don't have to do everything at once. Yeah. And then when you are introducing them into the house, certainly I would say the resident dog, if you get the resident dog out of the house, lift all the toys and bones that he's used to. So bring in the new dog, so that they can have a smell and look around without the other dog being there first. Yeah. And then you certainly bring the other dog in. Again, you're gonna do it for short periods of time and gradually build it up. And for the likes of meal times, keep them separate so that yeah. there's no conflict. Lift the bowls at the end of the meal so yeah. that there's the other dog doesn't go to the other dog's bowl and cause a conflict. So um, when we're looking at behaviour then, John, um, can some behaviour problems be diet related? Yes, yeah, so, um, that's an interesting point. When I started out in this route, I was looking at using nutrition as a way of managing physical health problems. I didn't really think at first about the, the mental health aspect of that, which was a bit silly in a way because in traditional oriental medicine, the two go hand in hand. Um, Body, yeah. and body and mind uh, uh, in harmony. Uh, so there are some, so a healthy, a healthy individual means healthy physic, physical health, good physical health, but it also means good mental health. And yeah. having the right diet for that can be a contributory factor. It's a bit, a bit more difficult sometimes to, to fine tune that. But basically, yeah. I believe that, uh, um, for a domestic pet, food which is slowly absorbed and low, low in fat and low in protein can produce this uh, uh, when based on complex carbohydrates can produce that uh, good mental health uh, which will help with behaviour. Yes, you, you certainly, you know, you want to be meeting the needs of the dog and not exceeding them, don't you? You don't want to be, mm. um, sort of, you know, overloading the system with anything in particular. Yes. Um, I, think, I think it's quite commonly known that, if you, that you know, over hyperactivity is often related to diet and a change of diet can make a difference. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of other me mental health issues where good quality nutrition can be helpful. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so again, sort of keeping with the behaviour thing, Deirdre, if somebody's bringing a, a, a new cat into the home, how long should they keep that new cat in after after bringing that cat home? Oh, ideally at least three to five weeks. You need to make sure the cat feels very settled and very comfortable in this new environment and wants to come back. So um, it varies from cat to cat, but uh, you probably, once you feel that your cat is totally comfortable with you, you've built up that trust, um, then certainly you can start letting it out for short periods and then bringing it back in again. Um, wouldn't let it open the doors and let it go crazy at first. No. Definitely just, again, it's a gradual process. Start building it up. It also makes you feel more reassured that it is coming back as well. And I should imagine you do get um, some dogs in particular in who perhaps haven't lived in a home before, um, aren't toilet trained. Um, so what would you say is the best practice then for toilet training your dog? Yeah, whenever you bring a dog home, no matter, even if it is toilet trained, because it's in a new environment, it is going to have accidents. So the advice we would give is certainly bring it out regularly to the outside area. Wait till it does something. If it does something, praise to high heavens. Sometimes you can use treat, but not necessary. And um, then bring it back inside. And so the key is regular going outside, wait till they go, and then praise. If they do have an accident inside, just take them straight back, straight outside again to do something praise and within even you'd be surprised even within a few days they start to twig actually if i go outside they're pleased about that and they will start to get better 
hobby pads I'm not a big fan of because it sort of nearly encourages them to keep going inside because they think it's okay. So um, if you can do it without hobby pads, do, because I think it really draws out the process in the long run. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, we, we spoke very, very briefly earlier on about uh, joint disease. Um, so John, can you tell us, um, you know, what is arthritis and, and rheumatism? Well, arthritis, anything ending in an itis denotes inflammation. So arthritis means inflammation of the joint. Uh, rheumatism is usually applied to stiff muscles. It's not an expression that we use so much nowadays. But the two go hand in hand, of course, because they um, they both indicate inflammation. And uh, so if you have muscle tension, that pulls on the joints and can cause pain. Very often the pain of, you think it's a joint pain, very often it's coming from you know, muscle spasm. So but those are the, there's a distinction, but the two go hand in hand. Really. And how can diet play um, a role in, in, in these problems that we see then with the, the joints and the dogs? Um, well, this is a theme I keep coming back to, with diet plays a role in everything. And uh, um, getting the right diet um, can reduce inflammation, systemic inflammation. Now, that's mean, that means to say inflammation through the system. So if you have the diet right, that means the right kind of food and the right amount, which is just as important, and that's one that's down to the pet owner rather than the, the pet manufacturer. When you get that right, the body can heal itself and uh, the inflammation will subside and the, the pain will go in. Yeah. Yep. Get it. Yep. And um, what should people be looking for uh, in a food then, where it's sort of, you know, more specifically when they're, they're looking at um, feeding their dog that has got joint disease or arthritis? You're asking me, are you? So. Yeah, I'm asking you, John, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, as I said, I'm a great fan of the a more natural way of feeding based on, you know, complex carbohydrates. The whole business is being built really on whole grains. Grains have had a bit of a bad press in recent time, but they're actually excellent foods, whole grains, um, brown rice, whole maize, whole oats, and we use that. We also we have a grain-free food, which is based on uh, potato and buckwheat. So grain-free, but still has the, the benefits of that. Yeah. Similar to whole grain. Low protein, low fat, high high complex carbohydrate, no chemicals. Um, that's it, really. You know, okay. moderate feeding, feeding to match the needs of the dog, and that can vary, and that can be quite a difficult thing to do. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, a question here for you, John. That's sort of a little bit more specific. So, uh, I have an eight-year-old border collie which seems to be in pain in its hips after a long walk and sometimes can have difficulty jumping back into the boot of the car. Is this something which can be treated with supplements? Well, supplements may have a role to play, but uh, they can, if you get the, the diet right in the first place, supplements may not be necessary. Uh, supplements shouldn't really be used to mask the, the effects of a poor feeding regime. So. I believe in anything, yes, if they, if they work great, but getting the basic diet right is, uh, is key. Right? Yeah. So and, and a eight-year-old eight -year collie should not be stiff at all. No. Something, something wrong there, and the uh, suggestion is it's a dietary issue. And and weight control is, is vitally important, isn't it, when we're looking at joint disease? Well, in everything, but, but particularly when we're looking at uh, joint disease in dogs, they need to be kept at a nice, healthy, lean weight rather than, than being overweight. Yes, well, excessive weight is actually should be recognised for what it is. It's a disease in its own right, really. And uh, it has a contributory, it's a contributory factor in lots of other health conditions. So, so not just arthritis and joint and muscle pain so um, yeah I think a lot of people overlook the importance of excessive weight it, it is a disease same as kidney disease is a disease and so on yeah, yeah. so when we're looking at um, sort of the digestive system then um, another one for you John what type what can cause digestive problems 
Well, one that dogs are famous for is what we what's known lately as uh, dietary indiscretion. In other words, the dog eating rubbish or things it shouldn't be eating, that can cause a cause acute uh, digestive upset. But when we're talking about, um, you see, recurring or chronic digestive issues, almost always diet is the uh, is the keystone for dealing with that. And even when you have secondary problems like bacterial overgrowth, for example, or uh, so, so on, parasites, getting the diet right can reduce the, the effect of that and normalize the, the entire system. And that, again, the same principles apply to the digestive system as other conditions. The right amount of food, easily, di I believe in easily digested food and as little as you can get away with, that allows the intestine to function at its best. Okay, thank you. And we hear a lot um, on the helpline about uh, allergies and intolerances. John, can you tell us what the difference is between an allergy and an intolerance? Yes, well, in one respect, they're very similar. The symptoms tend to be the same. Uh, usually, say in the dog, the symptoms are primarily linked to the digestive system and to the skin. But in fact, any organ can be affected by, uh, by any organ system can be affected. Uh, so something you should think of when you have a chronic problem which won't go away or keeps coming back. The difference between the two, the symptoms are the same, but the differences in how they come about. Allergy uh, is mediated through the immune system, whereas an intolerance is with an inflammatory condition so it's a technical difference, really. Yeah. So you can't, you can't diagnose. Actually, testing doesn't isn't really effective for diagnosing either. In fact, you know, there's a lot of laboratory testing. Yeah, that that kind of leads me on to um, to my next question. Really, is um, what should I do if I think my pet has a food allergy or an intolerance? You mentioned there that the the allergy testing they aren't particularly reliable. Um, so, so how do we how do we go about um, you know ascertaining whether there's an issue with the diet? Well, the gold standard for this is what's called an elimination trial, where you feed a single food, you know, such as it might be egg, for example, or rice, something very a very simple diet, and uh, gradually add to that and see if the symptoms come back. It's not very practical to do that, and so. A more practical way of doing this is probably really trial and error. Select a food which has got known ingredients rather than one which says um, cereals, meat and animal derivatives and so on. A food where all the ingredients are listed by name and a very simple food as well, you know, one with very few ingredients and just try it and see what happens. And uh, I think to some extent you need some a pet owner needs professional advice for that, you know, rather than just yeah. try and do it on their own. I'm sure a lot of people don't get the result because they try one food, they jump to another one, they jump to another one, and they say, Oh, we tried we tried your food but it didn't work. Did you take any advice from our helpline? No, they didn't. So it's a professional task. And so uh, but try and error really is the is the, the best way of doing that, I think, with a food which uh, maybe one is, is uh, manufactured and promoted as a higher, as a hypoallergenic food. Yeah. So, and Deirdre, you use burns um, up at the centre. Um, can you moisten the food? Do you sometimes moisten the food with the dogs? Can you mix the wet with the dry? Because ideally we do want the dogs on dry food. It's better for them. So, but we would have dogs come in and they're very fussy, come from all different backgrounds. So um, one of our tricks we do use is uh, we would moisten the food to sort of as a transition from wet food onto dry food. And um, we find that sometimes works for certain dogs or if they've had a lot of dental work and the hard food is just not an option, then we'd moisten the food for them to just to, yeah. um, help move things along, yeah. It can release the smell as well, can it? And, and, and sort can of do, yeah. yeah. We would add um, sort of warm water to it and let it soak in for a while and um, usually about 10 minutes or so to let it soften and then 
give it to them. And as you say, yes, that also the, just the warm water and even in its own would release the smell of it too. Brilliant. Um, another sort of specific question we've had come in um, here for you, John. Um, so we've got our active seven and a half year old boxer has always been on the right amount of burns alert food since a pup. Recently, he has lost weight and we are unsure whether we should increase his food or change his diet. What would your advice be? Well, the first thing is, is the dog actually underweight or not? Uh, I saw a collie in, in the farm shop yesterday, in fact, the owner said, oh, he's lost a bit of weight and they wanted some, some advice about getting weight on him. And I said, he's perfectly fine as he is. See, we've got used to the idea of overweight dogs being the norm now. So that a dog which is lean looks abnormal. So that's an important thing to decide in the first place. Yeah. Is the dog underweight? Is it, is it, or is it just lean? Which is usually a sign of good health, in fact. Yeah. So uh, that's the first question. Um, what would you do? Would you change the food? I think a little bit. As with food intolerance and allergy, it's not an exact science here. One has to perhaps experiment a little bit and try different things. If the dog is underweight, maybe the first step would probably be to increase the existing food slightly, see what happens. Um, that, may, that may do the trick. Um, another option maybe necessary is to go for Rather than increase, rather than increase the volume of food, one may have to look at a higher energy density. That's yeah. to say, food with a little bit more fat in it. You know, food intend, intended for the active dog, for example, or even uh, puppy food sometimes, which has got more fat in it. That uh, that may be the answer. For, for many dogs, which are, the owners think are underweight, they aren't really. They're just no, perfect. they're they're just perfect just, weight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we, we talked a lot about the, the digestive system there and the impact on the digestive system. Um, diet can also have an impact on the skin and, and we commonly see um, issues on the hotline, on the helpline such as uh, itchiness and hot spots, um, flaky skin, dull coat, that kind of thing. Um, what, what can cause these problems, John? Well, uh, food allergy or intolerance is well, well recognised. Um, uh, cause of that. But another one which I uh, I tend to give a lot of weight to is the idea of a build-up of toxic waste in the system. The skin, as well as keeping the body together, is also an organ of elimination. And so when there's a lot of waste products and waste matter in the, in the system, the body will try to get rid of that through, say, the ears and the skin. That will cause eruptions, hair loss, flaky skin, um, signs of excess in the diet. And uh, so that's that's the cause. Could be too much fat and protein or just too much food in general. Yeah, yeah. So so just looking at sort of excesses there really, isn't it? And and and, and sort of allowing the body to, to be in, in balance itself by feeding it. Mm. Um, yeah. I think a key word you use there is balance. Yes. We, all, we all think of a balanced diet. What does a balanced diet mean? It's a balance should be between be between what goes in and what is needed and anything yeah. anything going in there which is more than is needed is the excess which the body either has to get, eliminate yeah or or store in which case you're on weight yeah and what about the use of medication um because we do typically see that that these medications they just suppress the symptoms don't they rather than deal with the root cause of the issue well this is where i come in uh 50 years ago um Necessary in the short term, of course, but if you have to use long term medication for a skin problem, that's to me that's almost a, a failure, really. So, yeah. uh, getting the diet right and uh, just makes make call for some experimentation, different trying different foods in turn and doing it, doing it methodically. And a little tip here for dogs with skin disease, I think, is um is to check and empty the anal glands because the anal glands are scent glands really but they uh, they can act as a repository of waste matter in the system and by emptying the anal glands it's a bit like emptying the, the dustbins you get rid of all the rubbish from the system in, very quickly and that can help to detoxify 
detoxifies the system. A great little tip for itchy dogs, I think. Yeah, yeah. And how so how would somebody know if if that needed doing if there was a problem with the dog's anal glands? Well, I remember a vet telling me once I've got a little edge on my competitors. He says they don't know about this, about emptying the anal glands. So they should be checked when you go to the vet if there's an itchy dog. That should be routine. Yeah. The glands themselves may you, you may not know, but it should be checked. If there's an, if the dog is itchy, the anal glands should be checked and emptied. Even if the glands are not themselves causing signs of, of a problem. Okay. Yeah. And and you know why do those glands fill up then? Is it is it just down to that excess um, buildup of the waste in the system? Yeah, the body is trying to funnel the waste out whichever way it can. So through the skin, sometimes through the ears, you get waxy ears. Sometimes through the eyes, so you get mucky eyes. Um, through the gut, which you don't see. Um, through the and through the anal glands. A lot of people are given advice to increase the fiber in the dog's food to help with with anal gland issues. Um, is that necessary? Do we really need to be increasing the fiber um, in the food? I'm not a fan of that one, really. No, not really. I don't think it's relevant. Um, might help, perhaps, when the dog defecates. Maybe a little bit of a pressure in the anal glands, but it's not really the key to this. Uh, if it was a problem of increasing the bulk of the stool then anal gland problems is something you would not see on low quality foods because they tend to be indigestible and they produce a lot of bulky stools whereas a high quality food very digestible yeah. uh, can help the anal glands despite the fact that it doesn't produce lots of bulky feces so what dietary changes um could people look to make then if, if they've got a dog with anal gland problems well, one of the burns foods, of course, fed in the right way. That's what, that's what we're here for, isn't it? That's, yeah, absolutely. This is, my, this is my life's work, yes. <laughs> and how long, you know, should people expect to, to sort of it be before they can see those changes happening? Well, what, I just, what I found is that, let's say, for example, you change the diet and get it right, not just in, in terms of the type of food, but the quantity. And the, the anal glands are emptied, uh, they won't stop filling up immediately. You probably have to empty them at least once, maybe once, and then the problem should go and not come back again. Um, if you have to do it any more than twice, you probably have to look at the, you know, the type of food, the type of food yeah. more likely the quantity. Yeah. yeah. Too much food, glands will still fill up. Lovely. Thank you. It's such, such a wonderful topic for a, a Friday. Isn't it? Just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just some general questions here then um, for you, Deirdre. Um, so what would your advice be on the trimming of cat's claws? Well, generally, you shouldn't have to cut cat's claws. As long as they have a scratch post or something that they can claw at, then it shouldn't be an issue. Some people find that, that whenever uh, the cat's kneading their legs, whatever, if they're on their lap, you know, it could cut the skin. Um, and those circumstances, so as a last resort, if you have to cut them out, it's the minimum amount you want to cut off. You don't want to cut them too much off. Um, it's just basically to flatten the, the spike at the end. But ideally, if they've got a couple of good scratch posts, then it shouldn't shouldn't need um, any more intervention. Older cats may need them clipped back uh, to prevent them growing too long. But um, again, you just want to be cutting off a minimum amount. Lovely. Um, so someone has asked that they're hoping to holiday in Southern Ireland this summer, COVID allowing, of course. Uh, what do I need to have in place to bring my dog with me? Yeah, but a lot of people, lot of people don't realise is if you're travelling from the north to the south and vice versa, you do need a, a pet passport. Um, pet passport would mean that you need uh, the dog to be microchipped. It has to have a rabies vaccination, which um, the dog needs to be at least 12 weeks old for that to happen. Um, they also need a uh, tapeworm treatment done and uh, you need to be waiting at least 21 days from when you've had the rabies vaccination to when you actually travel. So um, it's important that all animals have this, especially with the change with changes with Brexit. But um, there is more details in terms of travel, even within Europe and everything else, if you want to check the DARE website. 
they have more information about any other countries outside of just Northern Ireland and the South. I should imagine that your vet would probably be able to sort of advise you on that as well, wouldn't they? They'd be exactly. uh, aware of Not, what... Yeah. Not all vets would necessarily do vet pet passports. So if you check with your local vet, they should certainly know who is closest to you to uh, get a pet, pet passport done. If that's not the case, then you can certainly, again, check the your website because they would have a list of all the registered vets that can do pet. Lovely. Um, David, can you tell me how I can go to Ireland? <laughs> the problem is no one can go anywhere at the minute. I'm, I'm confused. I'm still confused. Although I do have a I do have an Irish passport as well as my UK one. So. <laughs> and you're well covered. Yes. I am. <laughs> oh, it would be nice when we can start travelling again, won't it? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you touched on sort of you know uh, vaccinations worm in there, but for the pet passports, um, somebody's asked, I worm and flea my dog once a year in July. Is that enough? Um, people have might have the conception that they don't have to only have to do it during summer months when the fleas and the ticks are more active. But it is good to do it all year round for the worms as well. So um, there's different products that do different for different lengths of time. They'll be spot on so roughly about four weeks. You've got tablets that can last up to three months. So your best bet is to talk to your vet and work out which treatments are best for your animal. Yeah, they'll be best placed to advise on the different products that they stock, won't they? Exactly. Yeah. Can I uh, can I offer a, a dissenting view here? Of course mm -hmm. you can. Thank you. I think that. Uh, it's recently been discovered that I found the result of survey that in the UK at least, our, most of our rivers are polluted with these uh, these insecticides, and it's thought to be due to this routine monthly um, um, treatment in small animals. So, uh, when the legislation came in about controlling use of insecticides. This was done on agricultural products. It was not thought that there was any need for this in, in pets, but in fact, it seems to be a, a major issue. So uh, I think the prevailing view, certainly with the, the, uh, the British Veterinary Association, is that uh, pets should only be treated with insecticides when, when it's needed, rather than this routine um, once a month, regardless approach. So just, I had a dog for 16 years and I treated her for fleas about three or four times in 16 years. So um, do it when it's necessary, but not routinely. Thank you, John. Um, not just my, this is not my opinion. This is a, a prevailing view now, but it's fairly recent, I have to say. It is, yeah. The, 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 um, the studies and the sampling um, of the sort of streams and rivers, I believe it was for a, a specific um, product, wasn't it? It was just last year, wasn't it, that that, that one? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and vaccinations then. So um, sort of vac vaccination schedules, when should my puppy or kitten um, be vaccinated? Yeah, well, you'd get that normally uh, you'd have two vaccinations whenever there are puppies or kittens, um, usually around eight weeks and 12 weeks. And then after that, it's usually annual booster said. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so we have had, we've had quite a few questions in actually. So we'll move on to uh, some of the questions now. Um, we've got the first one then, Deirdre, is for you. Uh, morning, it's from Fiona. How can I tell the age of my rescue dog? And the vet that you would use would be able to give you a rough guide. They can tell by their teeth as well and general condition of the dog so um it's not something you could tell yourself without expertise so um certainly speak to your vet yeah, it's a bit diffi difficult sometimes to tell isn't yeah. it yeah yeah particularly if if you know the dog has been compromised nutritionally when they when they were growing up and developing sometimes it can be hard to age them just off of their teeth can't it so so yeah definitely need a, an expert opinion then on that one would uh Perhaps uh, microchipping would offer a solution to that. Does, it, does the dog have to be his age or date of birth or anything like that? Yes, the... yeah. The, on the microchip, it would have the date of birth. So that would, um, if the microchip's there, that's certainly a good guide. Yeah, you're right. Okay. That brings us lovely on to our next question, John. Um, do you think it's a possibility that all vets going forward will scan all dogs in through their doors for microchips? 
It might just help some dogs that have been stolen to get back to their rightful owners. Dog theft, very, very um, sort of prevalent in the, in the news at the moment. So um, what, what do you both think about that, John? Um, should vets be routinely scanning every dog that comes in um, for, their, for their microchips? Well, as you say, it would probably detect some stolen ones. And so it could be quite controversial uh, if you're... If the owner thinks that their dog has been checked to see if it's been stolen, it's their, you know, their you know, loved pet has been checked to see if it's been stolen or not. So um, I think it's, is it something that should be done? Perhaps, yes. Yeah. And um, you know, what are your thoughts on this, uh, Deirdre? Do you think that it should be sort of like a routine, a routine thing that they're, they're scanned as they walk through the door? As you say, it, it could be a tricky one. Um, it, maybe if it's a new if it's a new pet coming on, a new client coming in, maybe it might be might be an yes. idea to have it as policy. Yeah. Um, but as for a regular clients, not so much. Um, but, yeah, it'd be very reliant on people keeping their details up to date as well, wouldn't it? So yes, that's it. A new client or a new a new animal. Yes, um, just to check its history. Yeah, part of a routine. It's, yeah, because it's one thing a lot of uh, pet owners aren't aware of or don't even think of. Say if they move house or change their phones, they don't update the microchip details, and that's something we come across all the time. Yeah. Or they get their animal microchipped and they don't realise they actually have to register the details against that chip. So they think, right, it's microchipped. That's all I need to do. You need to make sure all the details are registered against the chip. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so Valerie here, uh, I feed my dog with long grain rice, with chicken, tuna and vegetables. She will not eat dog food of any kind. How many times can, uh, how many times should I feed her? She is a wee jug. So that's for you there, I think, John. So talking about well, home cooking there, what would your advice be if somebody was home cooking for their dog? Yes, well, if you're a professional nutritionist would say that 90 odd percent of home cooked diets are not nutritionally balanced. I have to say that back in the day when I was recommending home cooking, we didn't really check that part and I wasn't aware of any problems arising. So it might be worth to think if you're doing this long term, it might be worth thinking of some vitamin and mineral supplements just to be on the safe side, perhaps. How often do you feed? Well, um. Yeah, that's what she's asking. Yeah, how many times? I think she means how many times a day. So there's. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't have any strong views on that. Most dogs are happy enough with one meal a day. Most pet owners like to feed more than one a day. So I don't see it matters too much. It's the overall amount that's more important than that. Some dogs are bit. My dog's not very hungry in the morning. I feed it, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and Donna's asking, any advice on colitis, please? Uh, every time she tries to introduce a new food to her dog, there is blood in the stools. Well, the uh, question, come back to this, one of the things I said earlier, did she do that with any with professional advice? Yes. Um, I, uh, most people don't do that. They just try the food and it doesn't doesn't work immediately, might move on to something else. So uh, any change of diet should be done gradually over a minimum of five days. That's how long it takes for the, the digestive system to adapt to a new food. Sensitive dog, you really have to allow longer than that. Um, yeah. uh, one of our highly digestible, one of our adult foods would be worth a try. Uh, because they're highly digestible, which means that less material gets as far as the gut, as the lower gut to the colon. So it can take some of the pressure off the, the colon. So that's, um, but it has to be done with professional help here. Uh, another thing to consider is the question of um, sac a sacrificial protein. What that means is that if you have a, um, a diseased gut and you feed different food, uh, that protein can be absorbed into the system and set up an allergy. Mm -hmm. So the sacrificial protein is one that you might use as an interim food and not one that you plan to use long term. 
to try and get that transition onto a, a new diet. So for example, uh, a useful food maybe to start with would be uh, cooked egg, which is highly digestible, just fed on its own for, for a couple of days, and then gradually introduce some home cooked rice with that. And then gradually, if the symptoms are, don't come back, and introduce the food that you hope to feed longer term. But, and, but that's where the professional advice comes in. That's what we have a team of nutritionists for, really. Absolutely. And we um, we often see on the helpline that people take a great deal of consideration over the food that they're given, but then don't think about the treats and extras. So they're still given the same treats and extras whilst trying to change a food. And then they wonder why the new the new diet isn't making making a difference. So um, there are lots of things to consider. I'll give the details of our nutrition helpline um, at the end of the live. Um, see what else we've got here. Uh, question for John. I have a Bernese mountain dog. I currently feed her on Burns puppy, which she loves. She is almost one, and I was wondering, would it be more beneficial to move her onto the large breed dog food? Thank you. Well, it depends a lot on how she's doing. Uh, she's probably at the age where she should be moving on to an adult food now. And uh, a lot of big dogs, they tend not to exercise a lot anyway. So probably any stage now, they, I'd be thinking of of a change to the adult food. You know, the difference with the large breeds or, or the normal adults is fairly minimal. I think both of them would be fine, really. So, but yes, around now would be a good time to, to start to make that change. And, and again, that's what the helpline is there for, isn't it? So if you're concerned in any way, you can contact us and we can we can check on how, how the dog's doing and, and advise on that. That's not a problem. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, another question for John. What is your opinion on raw food diet for dogs? Well, when I first heard about raw food diets, I attended a lecture in a, at a veterinary conference in the United States where uh, Ian Billinghurst, an Australian vet, introduced the idea. And he said, um, I, was, I was feeding my dogs in Australia on what I thought was the best quality pet food and they weren't doing very well. And uh, he said, I put them on to raw food then, and the health problems went away, and the dog was so much healthier, much more natural way for the dog. And I was sitting listening to this thinking, I've got this all wrong. You know, what he's doing is much more natural. And, of course, that makes, that appeals, doesn't it? You know, the idea that the dog is a carnivore, it's used to eating meat and so on. But when you got to the bit where the health problems disappear, I thought, well, I got that as well. I got that result with my food, you see? And uh, so I've thought about this a great deal. And first of all, the, the dog may have been a carnivore once upon a time, 30, 15 years ago, but it's in the last 15 years or so, the dog has been domesticated and fully domesticated to the, same, to, to the extent that the dog has adjusted to human food. So what, what have humans been eating? What, grains and vegetables up until fairly recent times. So, uh, that's sort of, uh, the principle of that the dog is a carnivore isn't really true anymore. The dog may have the anatomy of a carnivore, but it doesn't have the physiology of it. It's able, it's omnivore, and uh, it can even be a vegetarian. Yeah. But so, uh, but it's also the proof of the pudding. They say we see that there's excellent health benefits with um, with what I've been doing: a whole grain-based, low-protein system. An additional problem with raw feeding is the potential for infection, um, contamination of the environment. Work has been done to show that um, pets which are fed in raw food tend to produce contamination in the environment. So when it comes to human food, we cook our food to make it safe. And uh, raw food is a potential hazard to humans who are, say, um, I mean, you know, have a compromised health system for young young children or older people, for example. And also, see, raw feeding seems to help to, to cause uh, uh, antibiotic resistance. So that's another problem that may come up. You know? and, and it's coming up in the future, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Antibiotic resistance. 
So some thoughts on that. Yeah. In the short term, it seems to work, you know, and people find it working, but uh, I don't really agree with it myself. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, just a, a comment here from Louise. Hi, thank you, Burns, for your donation of food for all the rescue Westies. We love you. You're very welcome, Louise. Um, Angela here. My medical blouser is struggling with a yeast infection in her feet. We have treated with steroids and allergy tablets, but she still chews at them. Would you suggest allergy testing? She's a yeast problem where? With the feet. The feet, itchy feet, in other words. Yeah. But I think that in, that in fact, yeasts are a normal part of the environment, and uh, uh, this dog doesn't have resistance to that. So, putting a putting the system should be treated in the same way as any other type of skin disease or any other type of infection. Get the get the diet right. The skin will become healthy. It will then become resistant to yeast infections. That's the theory. The phone's off. It's on. There we are. Um, yeah. So she's asking about shampoos as well. But again, like we, we we discussed with the medication, these these may be useful for dealing with the symptoms and relieving the the immediate itch. Um, but they're they're not going to treat the root cause, are they? So we need to get that system back in a in a proper balance. As that pet owner is finding now, yes. It's they may help in the short term to provide relief, but they're not really dealing with the underlying cause. No. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. Um, the lady who asked about colitis there, she, she's put she's always consulted her vet and, and, and had advice throughout this. Um, please feel free to ring us on the helpline, Donna. We can we can sort of give you um, some more specific advice then. That's not a problem at all. Um, the helpline then, if anyone has got any questions that we haven't had a chance to answer today or that they haven't had a chance to, to ask us, please get in touch with our Burns Nutrition team. You can email us on info at burnspet.co.uk. There's also a live chat facility on our website, Burns Pet Nutrition, or you can call our free phone helpline number on 0800 083 6696. I should know that, shouldn't I, by now, um, without having to look. Um, and if you want to get in touch with the, the USPCA and learn a bit more about the wonderful work that they do or about their rehoming processes, um, then please check out their website, uspca.co.uk. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and for listening to this today. Well, thank you to Deirdre uh, and thank you to John. Um, I, yeah, thank I hope you, you, thank you both. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yes, thanks thank to everybody. You. Okay, goodbye. Very much. Bye. Bye.